May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Guk Audio mini podcast, A Brief Memory. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable and free from economic hardship and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So um, I'm going to read more from uh, the cuke.com section uh, uh, with uh, page with the stuff from Steve Gaskin. Now this is an excerpt from his book Mind at Play. Uh, and he was a real... Uh, psychedelic guy, you know, the <laughs> the image for the cover, it's uh, like an old psychedelic concert uh, image. Uh, anyway, and I told about him last night. Excerpt from a chapter titled A Visible Spark, pages 73 and 74. Gaskin writes, I heard Suzuki Roshi was dying, and we had a 400 cubic inch Buick Wildcat medical car, the farm's only car that ran in those days, and I took it and left for California going as fast as I could. I had tossed a picture of Suzuki up on the dashboard, and it landed on the dash in such a way that it reflected right up, and was just like him, sitting there out in front of the car, and I was looking out through his eye holes down the road. I charged down the road, man, hauling, got a, got to where he was and got to the door. The gate man didn't want to let me see him, and I didn't want to push. I'd just been driving 3,000 miles as hard as I could roll, so I had a lot of inertia and push. Richard Baker came around the corner and recognized me, and I had such an obvious rush on that. He stopped and dropped me a gosh show real slow to see if I was too fast to notice that or not, and I slowed down and gave him one back. He said, what's happening? I said, I heard Suzuki Roshi's very sick, and i just come from Tennessee to see him. And I would like to see him if I could, but I don't want to make him no hassle, and uh, it's okay if I can. He said I could. I was so grateful. I went up, and I went to Suzuki's room. He was small and frail and very yellow, and he looked different than I'd ever seen him. He looked regal, royal, very skinny and very pale, and very puny, very weak, and very yellow, and very royal. I saw him, and my heart went to him, and I went running across the room. I reached out, and he took my hand, and it just stopped me cold in my tracks where I was. He couldn't have weighed more than 75 pounds or so, but he had so much power and command in his grip. It was like hitting a stone wall. Clank! It wasn't like he didn't want me up close. It was like he wanted to stop me until he could integrate me for a minute. He just held me off a little until he integrated that hammer down for 3,000 miles attitude I'd come in with. (laughs) He touched my hand three times that day, and each one of them said a different thing. One of them was just like you ran up too fast on a swordmaster and suddenly found yourself facing the edge of his blade while he figured out who you were. The next time he touched me, he drew me closer to him, and that was very full of love and very intimate. The last time he gave me his hand was like 
Maybe when the Pope puts his ring out to you, regal again. And the most of what he told me was in touch. I hardly remember any of his words. Hmm. Thanks uh, to Mark Bittner for transcribing that and sending it to me. I'm going to read a little bit more here. This is uh, from uh, Stephen Gaskin's book, Monday Night Class, from the newly revised and annotated edition of Gaskin's book, Monday Night Class, page 156. When Monday night class got up to about 100 people, I went to Suzuki and said, I have been teaching this class about spirit, and I have about 100 people coming every week. They are asking real life questions. Could you be my teacher? He said, I can't be your teacher. I have this whole monastery to run and all these students. What do you tell them about LSD? I said, I tell them that LSD can be a tool to search for inner truth, but that it is very strong and it shouldn't be used by children or used casually by people who are unprepared for the effects. He said, you better teach your class. And thanks to Mark Bittner for transcribing that. Then I read one I read last night. I mean, it's very short, but it's so cute. And uh, it says this is an outtake from Zenish right here. Huh. Well, maybe I put it in Zenish right now because I remember it. I was going over both those books, as you likely know. Um, he says, at a Zen Center picnic in Golden Gate Park, when Suzuki arrived in his robes, a baby blanket on the ground caught his eye. He lay down on it, rolled up in it, and just lay there for a while. Uh, that is, I think that's from Ina Mae Gaskin's book, Ritual Midwifery, and it's attributed to Stephen, that story. <laughs> it says, I have the book, but everything's been moved, so I can't check it now. I mean, this was something I put in here 15 years ago or something. And it says, Mark Bittner has it too, but all his books are in boxes because of painting being done. Uh -huh. And then, uh, you know, it's not just Stephen, it's Ina Mae too, his wife back then. Uh, she has Ina Mae Gaskin's website. There's a link there. Okay, I've got I've got a few things about Steve Tipton. Oh my God, it just keeps going. All right, I think I'm going to read it. Zinnies remember Steve Gaskin. I remember Gaskin from one of his nights at the old ballroom down at the beach. Later, taken over by Chet Helms for the family dog, Gaskin's manifesto that ranks up there with Ramdas for best spiritual sound off by a former academic back in the day. That's from Steve Tipton, who's a very accomplished academic and Zen student and a cool guy. Uh, Emory University. And then I've got from Bruce Fortin, who uh, Bruce lived at the farm. Uh, Bruce came to Zen Center uh, he had been, he had lived in the farm for years. He says, Stephen was my teacher. He was able to teach with great clarity, but sometimes you experience some sense of fear in yourself when you were around him, perhaps because his standards were so high. Many Zen students passed through the farm on their way to Zen Center. Stephen often said that Suzuki Roshi was the clearest teacher he had ever met but a disciplined meditation practice was not Stephen's way. I was Stephen's first attorney and incorporated the farm. The commune he started in Tennessee in 1971. 
in the original incorporation papers, which I think still stand, he wanted all of the farm's property to go to Zen Center if the commune was to fold. He always had great respect for Suzuki Roshi. I feel he taught me many things that I have found useful in my life. Uh, Bruce worked with me when he first came to Zen Center in the uh, at Green Gulch. And, uh, uh, oh, he helped me make some tables. Um, and uh, he said that, like, their practice at the farm was to smoke pot. Well, I wouldn't say I'm saying they smoked a lot of pot. But actually, it was sort of an idea that it would awaken you or something, somewhat. And he said they worked things out by talking. They were always talking about this stuff. And here's one from Lynn Henley Hesselbart, hmm, who lives outside of Atlanta and works with Clay and Lucy Calhoun, Lucy Bennett Calhoun. You know, they got a beautiful uh, farm there. They grow organic stuff. I'm going to read something from Lucy, uh, maybe tomorrow. So 1970, first encounter was going to Tassajara for a week of working just before the summer session opened. I'd heard of it via Stephen Gaskin, who led me to Suzuki Roshi in the first place. He spoke very highly of him. In particular, I heard about Stephen Gaskin's group when I was in New York, and it appealed much more to me than fighting against everything, so I ended up hitchhiking my way out to California with another woman friend who wanted to do the same. And finally, after a few months with stop-offs and more adventures, etc., ended up in San Francisco where I became a Gaskin groupie. But he did such a sales job on Suzuki Roshi as being the highest person in the West Coast descriptions like that, that I ended up being drawn to Zen Center. The first time I sat, the first week at Tassara, was the first time I had felt grounded in many years after way too many drug experiences, <laughs> LSD, etc., and I knew that I had come to the right place. That's from Lynn Henley Hesselbart. Lynn Hesselbart, now, now it's Henley's. Um, interview. And here we have from Andrew Maine. In the late 60s, I was involved with Stephen Gaskin crowd where photos of Suzuki were everywhere. Oh, and there's a picture on this page of Stephen sitting on, you know, he's pretty young, sitting on a table with a microphone. And there's a good hundred people around him or more. And they're all like hippies, beards, women with long natural hair, all white. Are, are they all white? I mean, there's so many in this guy. It's a good picture. And at the very bottom, oh, there's a picture of him when he's older. Oh, there's more pictures. And here's a picture. I was involved with his tombstone because um, Dana... You know, she got a hold of me, and uh, she wanted to use uh, Suzuki Roshi's uh, Enso, the Sumi Circle he did that's been so well-known. So uh, I helped her with that. And she also had some disagreement with other family about where it would be and this and that. But I think she, she as the oldest daughter, she, she uh, got what she wanted. So it says, Stephen, it has a picture of him on top, on a little oval. It says, Stephen F. Gaskin, 2-16-1935, so February 16th, 1935, to July 1st, 2014. Hmm. Beloved father, grandfather, brother, husband, teacher, and friend, we will miss you forever. U.S. Marine Corps, Korea, founder of Monday Night Class and the Caravan, founder of the farm, and founder of Plenty First, winner of the 
Right Livelihood Award, inductee into the Counterculture Hall of Fame. And there's a quote below. What a long, strange trip it's been. With the, <laughs> with the Suzuki Roshi's semicircle under it. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me for that. Uh, I love some of these characters that come through and are very benign people, you know. I, Not my teacher, and I was never... You know, I knew all about him. I mean, no, I don't mean that. I knew about him. I heard about him. He sounded like an interesting dude. Uh, I didn't go off and uh, and listen to other teachers. I did with Trungpa a little. Uh, and I had this psychic friend down in L.A. I'd go see an older guy. But I just stuck with Suzuki and Katagiri. Uh Hmm. Okay. This has been a Cuke Audio mini podcast, one of the longer ones. I'm DC Pubov, Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Dog at Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and Dear Lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. Mm-hmm.